So in order to understand the normality conditions for the central limit theorem for proportions, we kind of want to look at an example. Now suppose, just randomly, that 83% of all college students have iPhones. It's not actually 83%, but bear with me here. So we have four different research teams surveyed 50 groups of college students with different group sizes. Okay, did you catch that? We have four different teams, and they would go out and survey 50 groups. So team A would get 50 groups that are size 10. Team B got 50 groups that were size 20. So they go out and pull 50 groups of size 20 college students, right? So, so 20 college students, and then do it again, 20 more college students, and then do it again, 20 more college students. And then team C did 50 groups of size 30, and team D did 50 groups of size 40. All right, so our mission is to figure out which survey team um, group size or match each survey team's group size to their corresponding graph. And note that they're all drawn on the same x-axis scale. So these are the same scale for all of them. So which one is which? Okay, well, I think it's really obvious who the largest and the smallest are. Okay, so the smallest group will have Right, so smallest group size, this will have the most spread. Remember that, right? Because that part is still true for both central limit theorems and proportions and for means. And this will have the least spread. It'll be the most compact. Well, that makes it pretty obvious, right? The most spread is actually right here. Look, it goes from 0 0.600 all the way to past 0.975. And also the bars out there are really high, right? So there's a lot of groups that were out this um, at 0.60, right? So 60% of the students had uh, iPhones. So this is team A. This is the most spread, right? Their sample size is only 10. All right, now what about the least spread? Again, I think it's obvious. It's this one right here. This is team D. It's the most compacted in. Right, and also the most looking like a normal curve, right? Just kind of a sign. So this was sample size 40. Okay. Now again, how am I doing this? Explain how I can tell. Well, as n increases, right, gets larger. I was about to say gets larger in the middle of my word. Increases. There we go. The spread is smaller. And the graph is more normal. We learned that back in section 8.1, and it's still true. Okay, so that's why this one has to be the largest. It's the most normal of all the pictures, and it's the most uh, squashed in, right? It's the least spread out. All right, that leaves us with the remaining two, and that's a little bit of a tricky call until you notice the spread, right? See how this one is more spread out? We've got a value over here past 0.975. We also have values back here at 0 0.60. This one has more spread than this one. So that means this one has to be smaller in sample size. So this has to be team B with sample size 20. And this has to be team C with sample size 30. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, that doesn't look that normal. No, but it's starting to look kind of moundy in there. And it doesn't have the tail kind of going off like that does. Right? So it's got less spread. So I'm basing this on spread for sure. Now, what do I notice about the spread and the centers for all of these? Well, the center is about the same. Right? The center for every graph is about 0.83. So the center is the mean of the p-hats. And it's about 0.83 for all graphs. The spread, we already mentioned, right? The least spread was graph number four, or it's me, least spread was this graph number two, um, but for part D, let me see, group D, that's what I meant to say instead of group four, group D, the most spread was group A.
And honestly, none of them are normal, right? None. So if I want to say for, um, actually I'll do it down here, shape. None of them are normal, but group D is getting close. It's the closest to being normal of all of them. We could maybe make an argument that it is normal, but it's a little bit rough still. I'd like to be a little bit smoother to be a, a normal distribution. All right, so what have we learned? Well, <laughs> we still have um, a lot of things going on to make the central limit theorem for proportions work, just like the one for means. So proportions, P, right, what are the things we need to have? Well, we still need random, because we always need random. Otherwise, we have bias, right, which is a problem, right? So, and then, oh, otherwise bias. And independent, because we need to have those observations be independent of each other. Otherwise, we also have issues. But we make that happen if you're sampling without replacement. Without replacement's key. So if you're doing this without replacement, which we almost always are, then you would need n to be less than 0.05 capital N. If you're sampling with replacement, then it's automatically independent and you don't have to worry about it. So that's just a little remember. Remember that if you're sampling with replacement, you got no problems. Everything's automatically independent. So these two pieces are the same. I can actually make a note, right? They're the same in both 8.1 and 8.2, the condition 1 and condition 2. What's different is condition 3. We need the sample size to be large enough, but large enough is no longer 30. What we need is n, p, q to be greater than or equal to 10. And of course, q is 1 minus p. We learned that in chapter 6 right here. So NPQ must be bigger than 10. If that's the case, then we're large enough, quote unquote. That is different from 8.1. 8.1 just wanted it to be bigger than 30. So for means, you want it to be bigger than 30. But for proportions, it's a little bit different. You need N times P times Q to be greater than 10 or equal to 10. If that is the case, if those three conditions are met, then we will have a normal shape. It will have a center that is the mean of the p-hats that is equal to p, this is your parameter. Right? The only parameter you were given. Right? And then the spread will be the standard error of the p-hats, which is known as sigma sub p-hat, which we already saw. It's square root of p, q, divided by n. Or in other words, p times 1 minus p divided by n. And I have put a little note down here, remember, right, that 1 minus p is the probability of failure. So q is 1 minus p. Also note that if we're in chapter 9 and 10 and 11, we often don't have p and q. We have p hat and q hat, so you'd use those instead. But the idea still holds. All right, so a couple of things. One, the whole large enough thing is not set in stone. It's not like section 8.1 where it was set in stone at 30. It actually changes depending on the value of a population proportion, so, right? So it can be different from different values. So you just want n, p, 1 minus p. In other words, n, p, q to be greater than or equal to 10. That's what you want. And that varies from group to group, um, population to population. It varies. It changes.